I want to thank Rob and Peck to be here today to help us lead in worship. And Isaiah is uh, leading worship ministry for our student ministry retreat. And we've got over 100 of our students and adults um, away at Camp Buckner uh, for a renew retreat. And they're also joined by uh, student ministries from a couple of our church plants, uh, Huddle Bible Church and uh, Wells Branch Community as well. So about another hundred uh, students and, and adults. And so they got you know, a good group over there and they're not coming back until Monday. So you can continue to pray for them that God will really uh, bless uh, the time and make it fruitful in the lives of our students. Also, before we get into the word, I just want to let you know that later today, uh, your elders are going to be joining pastors and their leadership uh, teams uh, for a time of prayer uh, for the sake of every man, woman, and child in our geographical area. And uh, from time to time, I've kind of updated you on what's going on with some of the area pastors. And we really meet together and are partnering together to try to learn from each other. How can we best mobilize all of us, mobilize all of us as missionaries who kind of think about where we live and work and play, that God has places there as missionaries and that to build friendships and look for opportunities to share the gospel, that every man, woman, and child in our area would have the chance to hear the gospel and a chance to say yes or no to the gospel. So uh, we're working together on that. And today we're just getting together uh, to pray. It's our second time to gather together like this. So it's really something unprecedented in kind of this Pflugerville, Hutto, Round Rock area. And we're just excited about it. I want to let you know that that's happening at four o'clock today. Uh, would you join me again as we just seek God's favor now for our time in his word? God, we just remember that uh, you have given us your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we are uh, looking to you to teach us. Uh, Lord, we know from the word that you, your spirit gives us insight. Uh, he reminds us of truth and he takes what we've learned and he helps, gives us uh, uh, courage and faith to apply it to our lives. And so we just pause now and commit our time to you for your blessing. And Lord, may you use it in our lives for your good purposes and your pleasure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so let me begin this morning by just asking you, did you, uh, did you sleep well last night? Did you? Had a good night's sleep? One of you did? Okay. Uh, you know how sometimes you know, people ask, hey, how, how, did, did you sleep well? Did you get good rest? Uh, last night, and and uh, those of us who are getting older, you know, they tend to ask that question a little bit more. You know, like Kathy, sometimes she'll she'll say, "Well, did you sleep well?" And then she'll say, "Did you have any dreams?" Because she always has dreams. She has the wildest dreams, and so there's usually kind of a sleep report that happens, and then and then there's a dream report, and I, I just I, I could really spend the whole morning telling you about the really bizarre things. And so when I say, no, I didn't have any dreams, she says, oh, well, you just don't remember them. And I said, no, I remember them. Well, you didn't sleep really deep enough because, you know, you got to get that deep sleep. So, you know, I kind of have this whole sleep thing going on in my house. Now, some of you, you know, from time to time may wrestle with getting a good night's sleep. That's not unusual. And then sometimes, you know, we go into these times of, uh, I forget what they call it, but it's more of kind of a temporary season of insomnia when you're not really sleeping. And then uh, a few of us really struggle with this, you know, something that can be really, really difficult, what they call acute insomnia, when you, you, just, you just cannot sleep. And, you know, the doctors tell us that it's pretty dangerous, that if you have acute insomnia, if you cannot, if you're not over a long period of time getting the sleep that you need, like it really messes with you. You know what one of the things, one of the signs are? I know you're not going to believe this, but you're, you're actually tired. <laughs> Who would have thought? You're, you, you have like, you're, you're tired, like your energy level is down. Uh, some say that it can, you know, bring on more quickly or more easily serious diseases like diabetes. Uh, it can uh, uh, lead to accidents at work. And anyway, it, it kind of goes on. There's a pretty serious stuff. And so most of us are well aware of that. And we know we need probably more sleep than we're getting. Yeah, but we're at least aware of the danger of that. But when it comes to a different kind of sleep, a different kind of rest. Many of us aren't as acute about this. Many of us aren't as knowledgeable about this. That in addition to just sleep insomnia is what we might just call spiritual insomnia. It's the ability that um, not so much about resting my body, but resting my soul. 
Like, where do I find this deep, deep rest that my soul needs? Now, even as I say that, some of you are thinking, like, what really even does that mean? Like, I, I wouldn't even begin to know what that means. And if you were not here uh, last week, you don't know that we started a study on the a concept running through Scripture called the Sabbath. And uh, normally, when we open up God's Word, we're making our way usually through a book of the Bible, kind of making our way, you know, over couple, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But what we're doing right now is actually a theological study where we're taking this concept of Sabbath and learning what the Bible has to say about it. Because as we learned last week, even though the strict practice of a Sabbath day is no longer a requirement for us as New Testament believers, not a requirement, but it is extremely relevant especially in our day of age where most of us feel like you're just running on empty. But that God from day one, actually literally day six, put into place something he communicated from the very beginning that I want you to set one day a week aside, set it apart as holy, and uh, to uh, guard that day. And we started learning about what is the benefits of practicing a Sabbath. Now, uh, because we're not into some kind of, you know, work-based, legalistic, we're not uh, you're practicing the Sabbath like it is taught in the Old Testament. Uh, I'm not going to give you like a list of activities. Hey, you, these are the things you can do on the Sabbath. These are the things you can't do. No, we're not doing all that. A Sabbath is an issue of the heart. It's what we learn when we come into the New Testament. And that what the people of God were doing with the Sabbath at the time of Jesus was perverted and different, uh, uh, went way beyond what God had in mind for the Sabbath when it was set apart. And so what we're doing is taking a few weeks, just take a look at this, especially in the context of our goal this year, where all of us have committed together who call Hill Country Bible Church our home. We've committed to a time of spiritual health. And we said that some of the things that will help us enjoy our relationship with God and, and help us move more intimately into our relationship with God is learning to develop a couple of what we call holy habits, uh, what the New Testament calls discipline. Uh, just building in some discipline. Some of you are really making a concerted effort to spend time alone with God, reading the Bible, having a quiet time. Some are working on prayer. Uh, others are doing various things. But we're kind of talking right now about this concept of Sabbath of setting apart time, a regular rhythm of rest. And so that's the discussion that we started last week. And today, I want to give you another reason that Scripture gives us for setting apart time for Sabbath. If you were with us last week, what we said was this. Out of Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments were told to set aside a day for Sabbath. And in fact, let me just show you what that says. Exodus chapter 20 uh, we actually last week looked at verses 8 through 11, where it says, you know, set apart the day as holy. And then he, he goes into detail about whoever is part of your tribe, your, your immediate family, your servants, your livestock. And like nobody's going to work on the seventh day. He says, set it aside. And then he gets at the end of that passage to the reason. And he says, verse 11, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and that uh, all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And what we learned last week is the big idea was uh, Sabbath is a time to rest from making a living. It's a time to rest from anything that's required in making a living. And from that passage, we learned that one of the reasons we do that is that that was the example of God. You know, he worked for six days and, and then on the seventh day he rested and he kind of looks back over his creation work and he took pleasure in it. Remember how each day he creates and at the end of that day, morning and evening, the day ends and he says he looked and said, it is good. Second day, it is good. Third day, it is good. Sixth day, first time he says it's not good. And he goes on and says, it's not good for man to be alone. So he creates the woman. He brings them together. And then he looked and he said, it is very good. And that God rested and he enjoyed life as he's created it. And part of Sabbath that we learned last week is that the relevance is that you need a ton of a time of break where you actually not just move immediately to another project, but you actually take some time and you recognize that work has been done. 
And that there is a time to not just work at earning a living, but enjoying the living that God has given you. So anyway, I don't want to re-preach the message, but that last week that's what we saw. Now this week, we're actually going to look at the second giving of the Ten Commandments. You find it in Deuteronomy. You can turn there with me. Chapter 5, Deuteronomy chapter 5. But remember when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments and the people of God had already kind of gone crazy and they built the gold calf and they like completely just went opposite direction and, and Moses is angry and he throws down the commandments and they all break up and then he goes back up into the mountain and he gets a, a, a kind of a second um, uh, uh, he gets the stones a second time for the Ten Commandments. And what we find in Deuteronomy is uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments, or what we find there. And they're about to go into the land. So Exodus, they've just come out of Egypt. And then remember, they're 40 years in the wilderness running around. And then right before they go back in, Deuteronomy 2nd, the second law, he, he's given them, okay, here's a restatement of the law as we get ready to go into the land. So that's kind of the context. And I want you to see how this passage is completely identical to the other one until we get to the reason for the Sabbath. Let me show that to you. So in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we pick up with verse 12, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but, you shall labor, uh, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is with you uh, within your gates uh, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Now watch this. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Now listen, this is a huge, huge thing. Because what he's saying right here is that when you rest, and you, this whatever regular rhythm of rest that, that God leads you to make, he says part of what you're doing is you're remembering. Uh, you're, you're reflecting on the life that you had before God saved you. And then the fact that God did save you. And uh, that's what all this language is about here. It's different from what he said in Exodus 20. So the big idea last week, okay, Sabbath is rest, kind of resting from making a living. This week is about this. Sabbath is a time of reflection about how I am living. It's about how I am living. In other words, I had a life before God. And borrowing from the language here, it was a life of slavery. It, it was a life apart from God, a life of oppression, whatever it was. And then God mightily delivered me. In fact, uh, that's the first point here that we're going to make. If, you, if you're into following the outline, the Sabbath is a time of rest to remember. And remembering is a really big deal in the Bible. It is huge how often we are told to remember and set up memorials and all that. So he says, listen, the Sabbath is a time of rest to remember. I'll just give you the two areas real quick. It's, uh, first of all, it's remember my past in Egypt. And to remember my powerful escape. To remember my past in Egypt. For Israel, literally, physically, they were in the country of Egypt. And God rescued them out of there. But here I'm using Egypt figuratively because Egypt comes to represent my, my life apart from God. My, my life before God came into my life. It's my life when I try to go outside of what God wants for my life and do life away from him, Egypt. So I'm remembering my days in Egypt. And then second, this powerful escape that God orchestrated for me. Now, I want to look at both of these in a little bit more detail. But first of all, I want you to listen to these words. Uh, one of my very favorite books is a book called uh, Sacred Romance. It's done by Brent Curtis and John Eldridge. And he writes about this. And listen to what he says. He says, the most crippling thing that besets the pilgrim's heart is simply forgetfulness. Or more accurately, the failure to remember. Spiritual amnesia is so likely that from Genesis to Revelation, the scriptures are full of the call to remember. Now, over and over and over again, if we took the time, many of you could think of passages where we're told to remember, to remember. Where we read in the Psalms of these psalmists who in the midst of their circumstances would become overwhelmed. And then it says, and then I remembered 
the days of old. And then they go back and rehearse the greatness of God, what he's done. Remembering is the turning point in the psalm. Uh, we, talk, you know, we come into the New Testament. What does Jesus do? On the, he sets up the Lord's table and he says, this I want you to do what? As a, as a remembrance of me. You go into Revelation where uh, you know, the, the church of Ephesus had kind of fallen away from the Lord. They, they lost their first love, their, full, their first devotion to Jesus. And he says, listen, I want you to what? Remember from where you have fallen. I want you to repent and to redo the things that you did at the beginning. I mean, we could go over and over and over again with passages that talk about this. So listen, remembering is a huge deal. When do you remember? Most of us are so busy. We are so at it. We have so much going on that actually having time to think. Like even the time that when maybe we're not busy, there is so much media and messages coming at us. We rarely take the time to reflect and remember the way the Bible tells us to. And one of the things that God is saying to us today is that we all need a regular rhythm of rest. And one of those reasons is so that we can remember. So let's, let's kind of dig a little deeper in this idea of what do we remember? So I said, first of all, we remember our past in Egypt. Like, do you remember what life was like before you met Jesus? Some of you can't because you were so small when you placed your faith in Christ. You know, your parents led you to Christ when you were five years old or you were at a backyard Bible club or whatever. And so you think, man, I can't remember. I'm sure I was a really bad dude, (laughs) but I just don't remember. Some of us, though, uh, uh, came to Christ late in life and we do remember. Uh, Others of us, even if we came to Christ early, can think of times in our life seasons or whatever, when we were not walking closely with the Lord and we tasted life on our own. And we know what life in Egypt is like because of that. Uh, John Eldridge, to borrow from him, he, he says that when, when you think about your past life, when you, that, that, that you can think of at least three different areas. One is, is what he calls the arrows. And what he means by that is this, that in the, in the narrative of your life, that because you live in a broken, sinful world, where sinful people did things and said things to you that really did scar you in, in, in different ways, some, some very uh, significantly. There were things that uh, friends or parents or whoever said to you and that it s- struck such a deep chord that arrow penetrated so deeply that it influenced the way you interpret life, the way you see yourself, the way you think about life. Like you are so struck by those arrows. They have a huge impact on the worse end, different abuses. On a minor end, it may feel more like just a scratch, not just a wound. So when we talk about biblical manhood, journeyman, and rethinking womanhood, one of the things that we think about is like, where are we in life? And what were the things that influenced us that led to us to adopt certain beliefs, a certain worldview. All of that is kind of living in the broken world, suffering from the arrows of others. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But complicating complicating things even worse, more than that, is that we have actually uh, created issues ourselves because we have uh, gone after other uh, uh, false lovers, if you will. Uh, God, who is the great lover of our soul, uh, who has pursued us with this sacred romance, that we have oftentimes said no to him and have played the harlot with any number of different counterfeit gods. Sometimes it's a person. Sometimes it was a possession. Sometimes it was a profession that we have chased after the toys and the titles and the trophies and, you know, and all the treasures that, that the world has to offer, thinking that that's where life is. And we've said no to God. We've said, God, maybe you can take care of my afterlife. Appreciate that, God. Thanks. But as far as life right now, I think I know better than you, Lord, where to find life to the fullest. And some of us have felt that if I do really, really well, if I just work like crazy, I can get ahead and I can catch the rabbit. And that's where life is. And what God says, is that you need some time where you actually ask the question, is that really working for me? Is that really where life is? 
And so uh, that, that's what we're doing with, with Sabbath. We're kind of giving some time to ask the question, are these false lovers, are they, are they working for us? Third thing that Eldridge talks about that can characterize our life before God, before, before Jesus, is what he calls the haunting. And it's actually a, uh, uh, it's a reference to the, the biblical idea of how God created us with a longing in our heart for him. It's what the writer of the Ecclesiastes says is that how God has placed eternity in our heart. It's the sense that I've got a desire and a longing to connect with something bigger than myself. I've got a desire for something that nothing in this world can satisfy. As C.S. Lewis talks about it, he says, if you find within yourself a desire for something that nothing in this world can satisfy, it probably points to the fact that you were created for a different world. And that's what the Bible says, that this world, this home, is a temporary place. It's no better than a tent. And we're pilgrims and sojourners on our way to our final home where we're going to be with the Lord. That's what we were created for. And some of us, more than others, some at one time and not a different time, are aware of that. And though we may not use these kind of words to articulate it, it's a kind of a homesickness or something that this place doesn't satisfy. That's what he says is the haunting. And all of these things can come into play in, the life, in our life in Egypt, where, man, we're just slaving away under oppression. Uh, and and we, we uh, taste these arrows and the whips to the back. And we experience you know, our, our sinful choices of chasing after false lovers all of the while sensing that there's something that I'm chasing that I cannot satisfy apart from God. And so all of that kind of comes together. It kind of characterizes our lives in Egypt, our life before Christ. It's a sad time. Uh, Walt Disney did a movie a few years back uh, called The Kid. I don't know if any of you saw it. It featured Bruce Willis, who plays the part of this very, very driven, very hard-nosed, uh, kind of an image maker, uh, kind of a spin doctor for his rich clients who have PR problems. And uh, he's a very callous, uh, very jaded, very, uh, pretty much a cruel, a stoic, non-emotional kind of guy doing this hard work of spin making. It is, it's a, you know, nothing at all attractive about this guy's life, but he has made a pile of money, a pile of money off his rich clients. And then in the magic of movies, he uh, comes to meet himself as a little boy, uh, kind of a pre-adolescent, maybe 10, 11 years old, kind of a, a little bit uh, chubby, tender-hearted kind of boy. And they meet each other and they kind of r- realize who they are. And the, the little boy in the course of the movie is constantly calling Bruce Willis. He's calling him like, like what are you doing? Like, why are you living this way? That's not who I am. Like, what happened to you? He's asking, what were the arrows that killed your heart and made you into this self-centered person? And then the little kid constantly, and in a real warm way, is calling him back to live like who you really are. It's an encounter that's redemptive in its nature, is what the story does. And what you do on the Sabbath is you remember who God created you to be. You remember that when He made you His child, that He brought you out of this old life, all of its wrong thinking and all the scars and all the failure, and all the, all the junk. And with a powerful army brought you out of that. So, we have this past in Egypt. And then, what does he say back in Deuteronomy? He says, therefore, he says, uh, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And then watch this. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Uh, don't you love that? This, this powerful escape 
Now he says his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, a phrase that he uses elsewhere to describe this. But let me just ask you the question. Why does he name both a mighty hand and an outstretched arm? Why wouldn't mighty hand just be enough? An outstretched arm is this idea of God reaching for us to rescue us. You know, God didn't bring you into his kingdom and into his family because you were, you know, so good or you were out there chasing him down. And though some of us were, were, were perhaps seeking, a lot of us looking back, we just see God just came after us. He, with an outstretched arm, he brought us in uh, to our relationship. I, I would say it this way. My powerful escape is that God reached out for me. He initiated it. He went after me. He reached out for me. Second is that God rescued me. He saved me. He freed me. He saved me from the guilt of my sin. He freed me up to live life as he designed it to be lived. And then finally, God redeemed me. And remember that word, that idea of redemption can have the idea that that God took something broken and useless, and perhaps valueless in the eyes of the world, and he made it into something priceless and useful for his purposes, and he's given us this huge reason why to live, that God would use what he calls broken jars of clay and fill it with the treasure of the gospel to accomplish what he wants in the world. He's he's redeemed us. Do you know what God said to these people, these Hebrews, these slaves? For generations, these broken people, they came out of the land in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. He says, you are now a kingdom of priests. You are holy people who help people in the world learn how to relate to me. You are my audio visual to the entire world. Peter picks up the same, same language. And I, I think Second Peter, he says, you as well, you, you believers, you New Testament believers, you are a kingdom of priests. Let me tell you, your value, your purpose in life is not just to make a living, not just to raise a family, not just to get kids through college, not just to make enough money to retire. Your purpose involves all of that, but it's not limited to that. It's much bigger than that. And sometimes we need to remember that. But when we just work, 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 and go from one thing to another and never stop and remember who we were and why we were rescued, We will never live out the life that God intended for us. We will never enjoy life as God designed it to be enjoyed right now. Because we never remember. We never reflect. We don't think about it. The only thing we're thinking about is the next thing on the to-do list. The next errand to run. The next chore to do. The next account to sell. We are as a country, as a culture, consumed with doing. And Jesus says, listen, one day a week, I want you to think about being who you are, reflecting. That's what God has called us to do. Uh, We need to remember, it's very important, Blaise Pascal uh, when he was converted to Christ, um, November 23rd, 1654, I was so blown away by the mercy and grace of God. He wrote down these words. It's just a string of emotion. He says, fire, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, certainty, certainty, emotion, joy, peace. God of Jesus Christ, thy God shall be my God, oblivion of the world and of everything except God. Joy, 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 tears of joy. Years later when he died, they found these words stitched to his jacket that rested over his heart. There's a man who never wanted to forget the incredible thing that God did. When he said, we cannot, we cannot forget that. 
But what is the purpose of remembering? The purpose is to reflect. It's to reflect. So as we move into this second area of your outline, I'll just say, look, when you have this time and you're remembering, part of it is to say, ask the question, okay, in light of what God did for me, how am I living right now? Am I living out the life that God saved me to live out? And so this kind of calls for a time of assessment or what I'm calling a time of reflection. That Sabbath is a time not only to remember, but it's a time to reflect. And the Bible speaks a lot to that. You know, very, very quickly, Deuteronomy 4, 9, one chapter earlier than where we are. God says through Moses, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Make it diligent, man, to take care of your heart. Several hundred years later, Solomon will be writing in Proverbs in chapter 4, verse 23. He says, look, guard your heart. Like, take care of what's going on in your heart, because from your heart flow the issues of life. ESV translates it, uh, keep in all, with all vigilance, guard your heart. Like, what is going on in there? Listen, I am not preaching at you guys without preaching at myself here. Like, I know what it's like just to be busy and just to go after things. And sometimes you can do that and never take inventory on what's really going on in your heart. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, this is pretty, pretty intense. He says, um, examine yourselves. See whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We need to reflect. We need to examine what's going on. Here's three areas. Very quickly. One area to ask and reflect on is, is basically, what am I becoming? Who am I becoming? It's not about doing, it's about becoming. And so there's a whole area of kind of questions to ask, like, you know, what's really going on with me? Like, think about the end of your life. What do you want someone to say at your funeral? Uh, what do you want to be written in your obituary? If your best friends come up and talk about your life, what do you want them to say about you? What do you want your kids to say about you? What do you want your spouse to say, your colleagues to say? What kind of life do you want? Now, I know you guys, but many, many of you, if not all of you say, well, you know, I, I want to be remembered as a man who loved God and loved his neighbor, lo lo you know, loved his brother as himself, loved others. And in various words and examples, I mean, you, you think about who you really want to be at the end of your life, and then you ask, the question on your Sabbath, if I live the rest of my days like I lived this last week, will I get there? If I continue to live the way I did this week, will that translate into the life that I really want to have lived? Oh, man. <laughs> That's kind of just convicting. Isn't that a great question? Uh, who am I becoming? Second one is, how am I relating? How am I relating? Dads, do you know your kids? Do your kids know you? Um, you know, parents, it's great to ask the question, was there anything that I said or did this week in front of my kids that made Jesus really attractive to them? that made Christianity desirable to them. Husbands, what did you say or do this last week that made your wife feel so cherished that next to Jesus, she's the most important person to you in your life? Wives, what did you say or do this last week that made your husband feel so respected, honored, helped in his role of, of leading? How am I relating? Third area would be, why am I living? Speaks to purpose. Like, did anything in my life touch on the big purpose, the big story of what God is doing in my life? He didn't save me and leave me on this planet just to kind of go after the best life I possibly could. He left me here with a purpose, a job description, to get the gospel to every man, woman, and child. 
Was there anything in my life this week that smelled or tasted or looked like an ambassador representing Jesus? Any influence that I had? Let me tell you, you give me your calendar and you give me your checkbook and I'll tell you what you worship. I'll tell you what your life is built around. And a Sabbath is a time to just say, hey, am I on the right track? Is my life heading in the right trajectory? You know how you're in the train station and all the, all the tracks are right there together, right? And they all look like they're kind of leaving parallel, but some move just a degree off over the course of time, leads in a completely different direction, miles apart. And without a Sabbath, you're just working it, man. You are working it. You are working it. And one day you look up and you are miles apart where you thought you were heading. And you're sitting in this big auditorium. And your high school student is walking across the group platform getting his diploma. And you say, man, where did the time go? Bill Hybels, some of you know that name. Pastor is one of the very largest churches in our country, Willow Creek Community Church in the Chicago area. Uh, did a book recently called Simplify. Perhaps some of you have been reading that related to our, I think it's one of the resources that we recommended, but uh, he writes an article that's kind of on the same subject called The Secret of Strategic Neglect. He says, uh, sitting down before God with a calendar and a submitted spirit is one of the holiest things that you can do. Isn't that wild? Putting a schedule together is not so much about determining what you're trying to get done. It's about deciding who you want to become. What kind of husband? What kind of father? What kind of friend? And then asking the follow-up questions. What needs to be put into my schedule so that I become this kind of person? Yeah, I love that. It's one of those things that's just hurt so bad. <laughs> it hurts so good. You know, if you don't think, if you don't pause for a moment and think about how you're doing life, you just find yourself lost. Sabbath was designed as a time to remember, a time to reflect. And finally, it was obviously a time to refocus. Okay, so like, what do you do with, you know, after your time of reflection? Well, a time of refocus, it's the idea of refocusing with gratitude. Okay, I remember, man, like, God, you saved me. Like, not only from where I was in the past, but like, what would my life look like today if I didn't know you, Jesus? Uh, it's a refocus with grace. Because when you ask these kind of questions, let me tell you, it's easy to feel guilty, isn't it? Like, some of you are thinking, Danny, every question that you just went through, I'm failing at every one. But here's the grace of Jesus Christ. Here is truth. That if you were the most faithful that you could ever imagine being this next week, like you just blow, I mean, you knock it out of the park. That Jesus would not love you anymore. And if you just totally fail this next week, I mean, you just, it's like the worst week you've had. You just totally fell. Jesus would not love you any less. Because listen, believer in Christ, your relationship with God is not based on what you do. It's based on what God did for us. And when Jesus died for us and took away our sin and guilt and gave us his righteousness, that we have the standing accepted and approved before God forever. <laughs> and so whether you are faithful or you're a failure, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus loves you. Listen, that's the grace of God. And because of that, you know what you do? You just kind of refocus on a goal. You say, okay, well, this week, God, by your grace, I'm going to give attention to this area. I'm going to, you know, move forward in this area by your grace. 
confident of your great, great love. You know, God's grace is basically this, is that every day, every week, every Sabbath, he puts up in front of you this reset button. He says, do you want to reset? Yes or no? And like every Sabbath is a time to reflect and reset. Isn't that amazing? That's the grace of God. Well, I want to ask our worship team to come on out at this time. And I want to just pray for us and invite each of you to just kind of think about this incredible life that God has brought you into. Um, you know, whatever Egypt was for you, he saved you from that. Like you don't have to live in Egypt anymore. And let me just say to you that if you're here and you're new or, you know, a friend invited you or you've never asked Christ to come into your life and you don't even know what that language means, that this kind of life that God wants you to enjoy begins when you just say, I know that I'm in Egypt. I'm kind of living life on my own. And, you know, I'm, I'm living out these addictions or I'm, I'm whatever it is, but I'm, I'm not in touch with God. I'm not trying to follow after him. I'm trying to do life on my own. And that what God invites you to do is just, just to admit that to him and say, Jesus, I believe that you as the God's son, that you died on the cross, that you paid the penalty for my sin. You nailed my guilt on the cross with you. You paid for it. And then in simple faith, I believe that, and I ask you to come into my life and be my Savior. And the Bible says that by faith alone, not by doing a bunch of good works, but by faith alone in what Jesus did for you, and you just opening your heart in faith and saying, Jesus, I believe that, and I want that to be applied to my life that at that moment, you become a child of God. You enter the God's family. You're, you're born again. You're a believer. Your sins are forgiven. God has forgiven you. He's freed you, and he's promised a future to you. And then you're like all the rest of us, just living out our life, trying to walk with God, enjoying life as he designed it to be, one Sabbath after another. Lord, we just tell you that we love the life that you've given us. You've freed us up, God, to live life as you designed it. And we just want to tell you in gratitude and worship today how thankful we are. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.